Don't ask God to make it easier. Ask him to make you stronger. Don't ask God to prepare the road for you. Ask God to prepare you for the road. Don't ask God for fewer problems and challenges. Ask God to make you more experienced and to show you how you can become bigger and stronger in the spirit when you go through tough times. Jesus Christ says this very interesting thing in the Bible and he's saying it to you right now. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And those who hear my voice, if they open the door, I will come in. Many of us were living life with the door closed. We're living life with an empty heart. We're living life and we're not living at peace with God or with our neighbor. We continue to be in an ambivalent position when it comes towards Christianity or our faith. I want to encourage you this morning, make a decision. Invite Jesus Christ into your heart. He laid down his life on the cross so we could be at peace with God. All those tapes of what you did in the past, all the mistakes you make, God can throw those tapes away. And you can make new tapes with your life. You can make new memories. You can create new experiences in God's kingdom. Won't you receive the free gift of salvation this morning? You may not get another chance, and I want to encourage you today to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Simply close your eyes and pray to the Lord, Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart, and your life will never be the same. If you make that decision, will you text me the word hope to the number on the screen? We want to send you some materials and we want to pray for you and your walk with God. This morning I want to talk about the importance of showing up, the importance of getting experience in your Christian walk and in your life in general, the importance of building long-term relationships, and we're going to find it in this sort of famous parable that Jesus gives. Now this parable that Hannah read this morning, the very first thing this parable is teaching us is the availability of the good news. The availability and unfairness of the saving grace of God. That saves us not because of our works or because we're such good moral people or because we obeyed the rules right, but simply because Christ paid it all. That that's available to us anytime we want, and how sometimes it can feel that that's unfair. It's the availability of the gospel. You might know the name Constantine. He was a famous emperor who, uh, when he was marching on Rome to take the throne, he claims there was a famous river, the Rubicon, and over the river he saw the famous symbol of Christianity at the time. It's called the Key Row. It looks like a P with an X through it. And he took that to mean that God was saying, take Rome and take the throne. As a king, as the Caesar, he's often called the first Christian Caesar, and I guess in a way he was. But really what he did is he, yeah, he did all the things. He allowed the churches to be built. He allowed Christians to worship freely. He hosted and took care of various councils in, in Rome. But he himself was not baptized until his deathbed. It was just that last moment He was baptized, he confessed Christ as his Lord, and he died, and he went to heaven. Now, many people in the world would say, hey, that's a lucky guy. Hey, he did it right. He played that hand perfectly. You see, he got to have all the women. He got to do what he wanted to do. He got to drink all he wanted to drink. He got to go to all the parties, got to sin like crazy, got to do whatever he wanted to do, and at the last second made the decision, and still got to heaven. Lucky guy. Wrong. Maybe you're listening and you're a Christian and you say, hey, that's not a bad deal. I take that deal. That doesn't sound so bad to me. It's a little unfair, but hey, it's the rules. Play the rules. Play the hand you're dealt. If that's your feeling, I want to encourage you um, that there's probably more life in your faith than you're getting now. Anyone who says that Constantine was lucky is someone who's probably in bondage to religiosity, in bondage to all of the laws and rules, and someone that needs to experience the Holy Spirit today. See, I feel bad for Constantine. 
I feel bad for Constantine. Here's why. To be so close, to be so close to the river of living water and to never drink. To be so close to the line of Judah and never follow him into battle. To be so close to the bread of life and and never eat. To be so close to the tree of knowledge and never partake. That is a tragedy. I believe that there's a heaven and a hell. I believe some people go to heaven and some people go to hell. I believe the only way to get into heaven is to trust your life to Jesus Christ. He says in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but, uh, but through me. But here's also something I think. Even if everybody goes to heaven, even if somehow we missed a, a Bible verse that showed us everyone's going to go to heaven, the gospel would still be worth preaching. The gospel would be worth preaching because the gospel is life today. It's worth preaching the gospel. A famous book was written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Famous minister who spoke out against Adolf Hitler and died in a concentration camp. Uh, And he paid a great price. And there is a cost to discipleship. But never forget there is also a cost to non-discipleship. There's a cost to living life without the chain-breaking power of the Spirit of God. There's a cost to life of not living at peace with God. There's a cost to waking up every morning not knowing what your purpose or vision is for your life. There's a cost to waking up and not giving it your all for the Lord. There's a cost to waking up and not being amongst God's people and the joy and the power and the life that's in it. There's a cost to that. And yes, the greatest reason we preach the gospel is so people can go to heaven. Nothing like eternal life, but there's so much more to it than that. There's the power of the Holy Spirit in your life that heals families, heals nations, heals bodies, heals minds, does miracles, wonder-working power in your life today. That's worth preaching. Amen? Isn't that worth preaching even at 9 in the morning? I think it is. Amen. So that's what this parable is about. It's about some people that got in early and some people that got in late. It goes like this. It says, Jesus tells us, there's this landowner. He's got a bunch of work that needs to be done. So he goes and he finds some guys and he says, come with me early in the morning. Let's go work in the field. And they get to working and he realizes, I need some more labor. I need some more guys to help. So he goes to the marketplace. It's night in the morning, still early. He says, you, 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 come work for me. I'll pay you a denarius. A denarius is a day's wages. Let's say 150, we'll say $200. This is California, right? 200 bucks. So I'll pay 200 bucks. Still needs more work. Another guy at noon says, come work for me. I'll pay you day's wages. 3 p.m., see some more guys idle, standing around. Come, work with me. Five, five o'clock, day's almost over. Only about an hour's left to work at work. He says, come, come, come work for me. I'll pay you. And then it comes time, the day's over, and the man comes to pay all of the workers. And here's what the Bible says. It says the workers were hired about uh, five in the afternoon, And uh, each received a denarius, so that when those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. Now, when I was a kid, I thought this was so unfair. I thought this was so unfair. And it says, when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Hey. It says hey in the Greek. Hey. Hey. Those who were hired last worked only for one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who have been, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered to one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to to work for a denarius? That's what we agreed on. That was a contract. That was a deal. Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Here's a great question. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? All right, here's a good question we can ask of this story. Who benefits the most? Morning guy or evening guy? Who benefits the most? Morning guy or evening guy? Now, both have a benefit. Evening guy's obvious, right? That one's easy. Evening guy only had to work an hour, still got 200 bucks. Got to go on home with his $200, right? Feeling good. Still feeling fresh. 
Didn't have to work as much. It was easy. But here's what morning guy got and didn't even know it. On top of the 200 bucks he got, morning guy got, number one, affirmation that he's in demand. He was the first one that was picked, the first one chosen. That says something to a man or to a woman. Number two, he's not sitting there worried all day, what am I going to eat for tonight? How am I going to pay for my kid's school or for my wife's this or for my house that? Number three, he got more on-the-job experience, which I'm telling you is worth a lot. And most important, and this is the most important thing to pull from this parable, he got more time with the master. He got more time with the master. He got more time with the boss. He got more time with the work giver. He got more time with the winemaker. He got more time with the visionary, the builder, the gatherer, the master. And that's all we can ask for in life is more time with the master. That's the time that's worth it. You see, morning guy can't see it, but if he could see what I'm saying, he'd say, poor evening guy. Poor evening guy. He only got an hour with the master. He only got an hour in the field. He, he was standing there all day worried and got a little, at least he got some money. That's what he'd say. That's what he'd say. And that's what I say. We understand this when we put it in terms of sports. You remember in sports being picked last? Nobody liked being picked last. Nobody says, oh, I only had to play basketball for five minutes, right? Nobody likes warming up a bench. Or in high school when you tried out for that famous part in the school musical and you didn't get a part, you got some part that nobody cared about. Nobody says, oh, I'm so glad I didn't have to act as much. See, we understand in those scenarios that the exposure, that the experience, that the time, that the memories, that the people you do it with and the time with the coaches and the teachers and the things you get from doing it, build a man, build a woman, build a person, make a life. And this is what we really want from life. Very few people think this way, but it is so important, this is a great quote from Naval Ravikant, that we play long-term games with long-term people. That we think about the importance of experiencing life and drawing from every moment, even the ones that hurt, that are boring, that we hate, that we don't enjoy, taking as much out of that as we can. And to understand that we are doing it with the Lord. That even when it's hard, there's something there, there's some meat, there's some fruit, there's some tangible thing we can draw from this to become more and to do more. It's so easy in life to just clock in. It's easy to clock into work. It's easy to clock into church, clock into school, and when you get home to just check out. In, in, in a way, both things are checking out. You're checking out of life. But here's what God asks us to do, not to get through life, but to get from life. Get from life. Don't get through the week. Don't get through the day. Get from the day. There's so much to draw. Don't get through a challenge. Get from the challenge. Don't get through a lesson. Don't get through a sermon. Get from the sermon. Draw from it. Don't get through work. Get from work. And you'll see that your life will grow and you'll be excited and you'll be glad to wake up in the morning. Most of who you become is from being in the field and who you're in the field with. Don't forget it. Now remember what we do here at church, we don't trust our brain, right? We take notes. It's a good time to take a picture. It's a good time to write it down. Okay. So, so many people today want less work or no work. So many people today want less drama. So many people today want less challenge, and I understand that. Life can be taxing and draining and hard. We can feel tired sometimes, but I'm encouraging you this morning to want more from life. I'm encouraging you this morning to want more from your Christian walk. I'm encouraging you this morning to want more from your Bible, want more from your church, want more from your life experience. I'm encouraging you this morning to make a bigger impact. I'm encouraging you this morning to touch as many lives as you can and to become more. Becoming more is what I believe starts with showing up. It starts with getting in the field and getting as much time in the field as you can. Becoming more starts with showing up. 
Don't ask God for less obstacles. Ask God to make you bigger than those obstacles. Don't ask God to make it easier. Ask him to make you stronger. Don't ask God to prepare the road for you. Ask God to prepare you for the road. Don't ask God for fewer problems and challenges. Ask God to make you more experienced and to show you how you can become bigger and stronger in the spirit when you go through tough times. As uh, my grandfather said, tough times never last, tough people do. But in order to become a tough person, you've got to face those tough times and you've got to face them with courage. Amen? So here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you really want this kind of life, I want to encourage you to show up for a life. Increasingly now, we live in a world where we just don't show up. We send a text. We don't show up. We apologize the next day. When the phone rings from somebody that we care about, we don't like to answer. When the email comes in, we don't like to reply. When we receive an invitation, when someone needs our help, too often we just don't show up. Somebody else will do it. But I'm encouraging you, be different than everyone else. Show up for life. Keep showing up and you'll keep growing up. You don't have to be perfect, just show up. I took this wonderful class, a pastor's head, I took it with uh, Pastor Jim Cock, a pastor who's been in ministry here for a long time. Wonderful guy. Oh, and man, did we learn a lot in this course. And one of the biggest questions is how do you how do you help someone who's going through trauma? Whether they lost a loved one, or they're in the hospital, or some horrible surprise got them, how do you be a pastor to that person? And we learn that their temptation is so often to fix the problem, or to give advice, even if you're not a doctor, and really that's not the solution. The solution often is to just show up, to just be there. He famously says, 90% is just showing up. If you remember anything I say this morning, it's not something I said, it's something Pastor Jim said, and I want you to remember this, 90% is showing up. Don't worry about what to say. Don't worry, the Lord will give you the words. Don't worry about this or that or anything else, just show up. 90, that's 90%, and you'll figure it out as you go along. You might mess up, but at least you showed up, and that counts. Here's what you get when you show up to life when you show up to the challenges, when you show up to touch somebody's life or to help somebody who's hurting, you get experience. You get to experience your life. You experience the doing. Yes, you experience the crying, but you experience the laughter as well. You experience the winning and the losing. You experience the power of God. And most of all, you experience the people who are doing it. And you develop the kind of relationships that will transform your life and the world. Here's what you get when you show up. You get experience. This is the first thing. And this is so important. Experience. For all you uh, millennials and Gen Zers out there who are trying to find a job, what's the number one thing employers ask uh, when you apply for a job? Do they ask your, what your degree is? No, sir. It's, maybe it matters, I don't know. But here's the number one thing they ask for. What's your job experience? What's your experience? And a lot of people today get frustrated because they say, well, how am I supposed to get experience if I don't get a job? And how am I supposed to get a job if I don't get experience? But can I just tell you something? There's lots of ways to get experience without getting a job. My friend, there is. People think, uh, you know, so often that it's all about the pay. Here's the biggest, you get two salaries in a job. I've told you this before, right? Here's the first salary you get, it's, it's money. Here's the second salary you get, it's experience. And both are important. This is one of the most important questions we can ask about our job is who am I becoming in the workplace? Who am I becoming in my church? Who am I becoming in this group of friends? And how is that experience transforming my life? Okay. So famously, a, this general said, the spoils of war is not money, but good soldiers. I think that's right. You have to get in the field. You have to get doing things for God. You have to be bad at something before you're good at something. And this is a key, okay? The second thing you get from showing up to life, 
to showing up to a challenge, to showing up for somebody who's hurting, to show up to pray for someone or share your faith or when you show up to a church or any of these things. Here's the second thing you get. You get relationships, long-term relationships with long-term people. And the longer you're with them, the more you know who you're dealing with. And you're able to sift out the good from the bad, the partners from the people that maybe you need some distance from. You develop a network of people that will transform your life. That when you're there for them, they're gonna be there for you. When you become a show up person, you attract show up people into your life. And boy, can I tell you, the older I get, the more important I see the value of friendships, especially these kinds of friendships, people who show up. Boy, is that so important. Can we just say this? Your dream cannot succeed without other people. Nor should it. Think about this. Jesus, whenever he sends the disciples out, he always sends them out two by two. Jesus would send them out without food. He would send them out without even sandals sometimes or without a jacket. He would send them out without a weapon. He would send them out with nothing except he would never send them alone. Let us learn something from this. It's the only thing that they shouldn't be without as a partner or someone to do life with. The bigger your dream, the bigger your team. You have a big dream, you need to get a group of people around you, or you need to get in a group of people that are going somewhere or doing something, and you'll find that whatever it is you want to achieve, it's going to be impossible by yourself. I realize this, that the bigger your dream grows, the more you need more people. And that's hard because people are messy. We're, we're not thinking creatures who feel we're emotional creatures who think afterwards. I've just learned that as a pastor. There's so many emotions, so many things going on at the surface. But I know that there's a lot of drama, but it's worth it if you have a big dream. When I was a pastor of a small church, we didn't need a lot of people. Needed a couple musicians, needed a children's minister, needed a little bit here, maybe some people to help set up and tear down. Now that I'm a pastor of a larger ministry, boy, if I had to create a list of all of the people the employees and volunteers and the hours and hours of work and planning that go into not just making a church service, but helping people who are hurting and packing meals and creating music and creating a television service. It takes an army. And the bigger that dream gets, the bigger the team gets. It just is part of it. And you just see the value of people. Okay, not only is the bigger your dream, the bigger your team, the bigger your dream gets, the bigger the people have to be as well. And that's the other thing about developing people is you start to attract into your life big thinkers, people who have specialized knowledge, and most importantly, people you just have great chemistry with. It's hard to put something on that, but this is so important. The bigger the dream, the bigger the people. Do you have a ministry on your heart? You need to get around big people. If you want to write a book, you want to create a work of art, you want to create some business for the kingdom, you want to make an impact in the world today, you want to make some kind of political impact, you want to do a change in your school, your society, you've got to get big people around you. And here's the biggest person you should get around you. Here's the person, the type of person, the person you got to get in your, on your team. Here's one person, if you get around this person, your life will never be the same. Every dream will be achievable, your life will be completely different, and his name is Jesus Christ. Just get around the Lord. Amazing how often we think about this person and that person, but we don't think about just getting around the Lord, you know? Hey, here's something I can promise you. If you get close to Jesus Christ, you're going to get around people who think and act like Jesus Christ too. If you, wanna, if you say, I can't find those people. I can't find Christians where I live. I can't find people who have big dreams. I can't find people who are positive and full of life. Get around Christ and you'll get around people who are getting around Christ. You want your marriage to be better? If you're, you're in a Christian marriage, get, you think, how do I get closer to my spouse? Get closer to Christ, and you'll get closer to your spouse. That's a promise. When you get close to him, you get close to people who are like him. And I just want to finish again by encouraging you to make that decision this morning. So often in life, we have all these problems we want to solve, and they're important to God. But very often we forget the most important decision of all. The most important thing we can do is to be at peace with God. 
to be full of his power. I want to encourage you this morning to make a decision to follow Christ and your life will never be the same. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all you've done for us. And I pray for my church and I pray for the people under the sound of my voice, your church. I pray that they would be full of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would give them fresh vision. I pray that you would attract the kind of people in their life that will build them up and not tear them down. I pray that you would give them a desire for more from life. Not less pain, less challenge, less worry, but more strength, more insight, more wisdom, more skills, more experience. I pray that they would be above and not beneath, the head and not the tail, and I pray most of all that Jesus Christ, you would be the king of their heart and that you would reign over their life and that you would help them to walk every day in your power, in your life, and in your joy. And I ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching Hour of Power on YouTube. We hope this message encourages you. Like and subscribe below for more encouraging content.